Well, Nora, welcome back to the UK. Thank you. And welcome to Ronnie Scott. It's exciting. <laughs> we should explain that we're in the uh, upstairs bar, so this is kind of like the calm before the storm, isn't it? I mean, everyone's getting ready downstairs. <laughs> Sound checking and so on. What's the what's the kind of uh, routine for you on a gig day? Um, you know, I try to get enough sleep. That's the main thing because you got to be up late. But um, I have no crazy routines. I, I try to warm up now, and that's about it. Mm. When did Ronnie Scott's kind of come into your consciousness as a as a sort of landmark on the jazz scene? It was a long time ago when I was in town playing, and um, I was just kind of struck at how beautiful the room was, you know, and how good it sounded. And I did a little promo thing here once, and it was just so, it, the, it just has a good vibe and it feels good. There are certain spots around the world, aren't there, which mm -hmm. you know you, you obviously become associated with the, the more you play. Yeah. Um, but it's quite an achievement, isn't it, to, you know, to, to, to keep a place like this with the reputation that it still has after all this time, you know, in a, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a world where you can't guarantee that live venues are even gonna carry on. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really special to play uh, an older club like this that has a lot of history because, yeah, a lot of them aren't around anymore. So we're right before the show. Just explain a little bit about what people are going to see downstairs. Um, so these are these are some trio shows I'm doing with uh, Chris Thomas on bass and Brian Blade on drums. And they played on my record, and um, I've played with Brian off and on over the years, but I've never gotten to really just do some loose, uh, stripped down stuff with him until we made the record. And and even though we added a lot of stuff to the record, different instruments, play with different people, it started out as just the three of us doing doing some of the songs as a trio, and it just felt good. And they're such great guys and amazing musicians, and we kind of, to me, we clicked. I mean, I'm sure they click with everyone because they're so good, but um, we've been trying to book this for a long time, so it finally came together. And for me, it's been really, really exciting to play the piano in the last couple of years. I've played more and more piano, and even though it's the instrument I started on, I kind of shied away from it and played a lot of guitar over the years and kind of whatever makes the song. But um, lately, I've been enjoying it, and um, so it feels really good to just sort of be the only chordal instrument on stage. It's the first time I've really done this since I moved to New York and was playing small trio shows. but. Um, when I started writing songs and making my first album, it, that kind of stopped, and I always had a guitar player at the very least, in addition. So it's it's really fun to strip it down, and I've been able to play a lot differently, and it's it's just kind of loose. The songs sound different every night, so you never really know what's going to happen. It, the freedom of it is really fun. It's just got less structure. And it's a reflection of the fact that the album itself has more space in it, doesn't it? Yeah, the album the album has a lot of space in it. I mean. I think all my albums have a lot of space in it, some more than others, but I'm, I'm kind of a min minimalist in a way. But um, yeah, over the years, I've really enjoyed having a full band with guitar and sometimes two guitars. And it's, it's fun to strip it all back down and see, just sort of reconnect with the way I'm playing piano. And you know, when I started making this album and when I started thinking about these trio shows, I was thinking of kind of going back to where I started, which was more in the jazz genre. But now that we're doing these shows, I realize that's that's not how I would define this necessarily. Um, it's just, it's got its own thing, you know? It's a trio and it's um, piano, but um, we're just playing songs. That's all it is. It kind of turns into its own thing. Yeah, I wouldn't be the first person to say that you you, you kind of are your own genre. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think everyone is to a point. I think I think genres can be, um, a little limiting when you try to talk about music. Music should be this free thing that um, if you try to put it in a box, I don't think it'll fly as much. So this is really what this playing with these guys is in this sort of format and having it be loose and doing two sets a night and um, small clubs and stuff. It's supposed to be, you know, a little bit of freedom, more freedom. Because jazz, much as we love it, it can, it's, an, it's an emotive word, isn't it? It's the same as country or anything. People think <laughs> they know what it means. And yeah, it means something different to a lot of different people, the, the, the genre words. So yeah, I try to stay away from that. <laughs> and also, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about these shows and thinking, oh, there'll be more jazz shows. But no, actually, I'm not adding any songs that are really outside of my... Um, normal repertoire, like I'm not necessarily playing jazz songs, they're just a lot of songs from the albums and um, they're just songs. <laughs>
With, with, with every new album comes the challenge of building the set list and which ones you leave out from the, yeah. the old days, because you want to do justice to the, to the, the Daybreaks album, don't you? Yeah. Has that been a challenge to, uh, to fit it all in? Um, no, I mean, it's fun. Actually, we played five shows last week in New York, and we did two sets a night, but with the same audience, so it was totally different sets, um, whereas the, these are a different audience, so there'll be a few songs repeated, but... I mean, it made it really fun because it, it gave us more options so we didn't have to play the same set every night. So, but yeah, there's songs that are the favorites and that I've enjoyed more and then songs that, oh, that was nice, we could do that anytime, but I don't have to do it every night. It's a wonderful time for love. The Daybreaks album had, had a kind of specific starting point, didn't it? Or there was a, a show that you played where, you know, the idea kind of formed for the album, is that right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I did, I, I kind of was off the road for a while and I wasn't playing a ton of music and then I did a show at the Kennedy Center with um, Wayne Shorter and Brian Blade and um, Jason Moran and John Patitucci and it was a, a 75th anniversary concert for my record label, Blue Note, which is a jazz label. So um, the musicians all there were were great, all these amazing musicians and um, I don't know, it just kind of reminded me of this sort of style that I love and that I am schooled in, you know, but I just haven't really gone in that direction in a long time. So it kind of inspired me and I get excited playing piano for the first time in a long time and I'm just sort of collecting new stuff. Because you'd done, you know, right before that, you'd been kind of experimenting in different styles, hadn't you? And, yeah. you know, moving down a slightly more pop avenue, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did the album with Danger Mouse last, and I love that album. It's fun. It's fun doing different things. Actually, the songs from that album might be my most favorite songs that we're doing in this trio, just the way they are totally different, because that song was so different production-wise and so specific sonically. And so to strip those songs down and realize that, oh, they're great, they're just great songs too, and, and they, they fit, I mean, whatever, as long as you're singing the song heartfelt, um, then the structure of the song should be able to float into any arrangement, I feel like. Your relationship with the piano has changed back, you know, with the, with this record and, and the different way that you've made it. I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit like sort of re, re acquainting yourself with a very old friend. Yeah, I think my relationship with the piano has changed a lot. I think, I think a long time ago, I I shied away from certain things and I felt like, oh, this sounds too piano-y. And now I kind of own it a little bit more. And if it sounds piano-y, I'm if I don't like the piano-y way it sounds, then I change it and I make it sound cool, you know, uh, in a way that I like. And so I think I feel, I mean, as anything with age and practice, you just get better at it. You get more second nature. You get more familiar with the instrument. And I mean, I hope I keep getting better. I don't want to stop. I remember uh, doing, having a lovely conversation with Bruce Lundvall, um, which featured a lot of talking about you, of course, <laughs> um, at a certain point around the time of the second album, I think. And, um, just talk about how important he was to you and also to, to Blue Note, because he is the guy that kind of re revived, you know, mm -hmm. created the modern version of the Blue Note label, really, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, Bruce was Bruce was um, super supportive of me and also gave me a chance when I didn't quite fit into the mold of what the label was, but he, he decided to say, OK, it's OK. You don't have to just make a jazz record. Do what you're doing, which is interesting. Not the jazz, you know, because the kind of jazz I was playing at the time was just old standards, which I loved so much, but it has been done so much. So I wasn't writing those kinds of songs. I was writing these weird three chord country songs, not weird, but <laughs> simple songs. So um, I think Bruce gave me a lot of freedom to just kind of explore whatever avenue I, I was going down. I was so young when I signed to the label, so he could kind of recognize that I haven't quite found my voice yet. And so when we were just sort of striking out and, and I was finding what I was doing, I was figuring it all out, I mean, that's when I met Bruce. Mm. And so he let me continue to do that, and that was a big deal. And he was a good friend. Yeah. What was your um, knowledge of Blue Note growing up? I mean, was it, was it an important label to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I grew up listening to all these old classic jazz records, and Blue Note was a huge, I was like, legend mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, of course. I didn't know much about um, behind the scenes. I didn't know much about um, the people who ran it, but then in the 90s, when, it, when he kind of revived it and put out some modern records, you know, I was in love with the Cassandra Wilson album, New Moon Daughter, and um, so that's definitely, you know, continued my sort of love for the label. The great thing with Blue Note now, of course, is that it's a, such a lovely combination of it, its own history and the future. I mean, yeah. as, as proved by someone like Wayne Shorter, who you've, you've worked with, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you're looking backwards and forwards at the same time, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Wayne is so amazing. <laughs> and he's still just doing it. He's just incredible to watch and listen to and even talk to. He, he's just sort of this, this being, you know. He just sort of embodies this music. So it was a real honor to play with him and watch him play and just work with him side by side. And the modern day Blue Note, you know, it has such a identity, uh, you know, 21st century identity under, under the guidance of the, the inimitable Don Wars. Yeah. Um, which is important because he's both, you know, a, a head man for the label, but also, you know, a, a, a very much in demand producer and musician. Yeah, he's busy. Yeah. He's very busy. But that must be great to have, an, you know, a, an artist who's running a ship. Yeah, I mean, Don has been super, super um, helpful and loving and just, like, comes at everything with, with uh, the right intentions, and that's, of course, what you want. <laughs> And not everybody has that, I guess, you know, historically. I've been really lucky working with Bruce and now with Don. But, um, yeah, you've heard a lot of horror stories out there. So it's been wonderful that Don's kind of taken it on. Mm. And, you know, you, you're in a position where you are able to do side projects and, you know, the little willies and, and, and things like that. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you're on Keith Richards' last album, which was <laughs> yeah. a, such a highlight of that record. Thanks. I love that song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, I felt like that was the kind of, you know, really secret kind of soul track of the year in a way. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I was super surprised and excited to get the call to do it. Mm. But it's a, that's a, you know, I mentioned it because it's a good uh, um, example of how your, your style stretches out in, in many different directions, doesn't it? You know, and, uh, it includes that working with somebody from the rock arena. But then there yeah. are shades of country about what you do sometimes as well, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, I'm from Texas and you can't take that out of me. <laughs> was that so. a big part of, of your early listening country music, would you say? I mean, it was and it wasn't. It was just kind of in the air down there, I guess. But my mom's also from Oklahoma, so my grandparents' house growing up, you know, yeah, it definitely was around. And um, my mom listened to a lot of soul music. She loved Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles. But all that stuff is country too, you know? It's got, it's got that element in it. So I have it from kind of a few different sides for sure. You think you've ever been able to sort of analyze your own vocal style and think, yeah, actually, there is a little bit of Aretha in there, or a bit of, I mean, are there people Oh, I try to stay away from that, yeah. especially singing. It's like the second you try to analyze your vocal style or your, it just gets thought out, and to me, it feels wrong <laughs> and contrived. So I try not to think about that. But I grew up, of course, I grew up imitating Aretha and singing and along with her records and Billie Holiday and so many others. So. You know, that's how you learn. Were you a record buyer from an early age? I loved music. I, yeah, I mean, I, I bought cassettes and then I bought CDs and I had some albums too. Yeah. Well, more in the pop area, would you say at first? Or, or I mean, you... I think my mom always had a lot of great records, so I grew up listening to her records, which was Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin and Willie Nelson and Billie Holiday. And, and then when I, I mean, the first cassette tape I bought was Digital Underground, so right. I definitely bought all kinds of stuff. I remember buying Jeff Buckley's CD and not having no idea what it was. I just thought it was a cool cover, <laughs> you know, um, I, when I bought Grace. And then, you know, in high school, I got really obsessed with jazz and I bought a, a ton of jazz albums. It took you to, uh, a while to get, to get comfortable with performing? I mean, is it something that came naturally to you? Or is yeah, that... I mean, it's still it's still getting comfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved playing music. I mean, performing is a funny term because performing is really just playing music in front of people, but there's a whole art to, like, performing, too, which I've never quite... Um, I have a hard time being fake in general, but I have a 
So I have a hard time being fake on stage. So when I'm performing, sometimes I'm nervous and sometimes I don't want to talk to the audience. And sometimes I'm loose and comfortable and I do talk to the audience. Sometimes I look more at the audience, sometimes I don't. You know, it's just about the comfort level. Hopefully the music never suffers for it. But as far as like performing, yeah, the in-between bits, in-between songs is the hard part for me. <laughs> yeah, the playing's the easy bit. Right? Yeah, the music, the music part's easy. Just talking to people is kind of like, either you feel comfortable or you don't. Just like going to a party, right? Yeah. You're either the life of the party or you're the wallflower and you don't know what to say. You feel awkward. <laughs> Have some of the early songs changed over the years, do you think, as you perform them? I mean, if you take a song like Come Away With Me, I mean, is yeah. it different now from where it, when it was born? Um, I mean, yes and no. It's like the way you relate to songs can change over the years. And, um, yeah, I mean, the way I sing it and play it, I'm sure, is different from the beginning. But hopefully it's just like a, like a nice jacket that wears well with age, you know? It gets better and better. Um, or not. <laughs> it depends on the song, <laughs> you know. Well, what do you, when you go to a show, what, do you, what, do you, what are you like as a, as a um, member of an audience? Are you a good um, member of an audience? I mean, I try. I don't go to a lot of shows and sit in the front row and go like this. But like, you know, I don't know. I'm, I listen, yeah. I had a conversation with, uh, with another artist recently who told me that, you know, he's convinced that all artists are terrible members of the audience. Oh, they're just, probably. Because they're just working and figuring things out. Yeah, the they're probably overthinking everything. Oh, well, they, well, that lighting cue is interesting. Oh, well, the sound is whatever. Oh, well, you know, they sound good, but they're really hamming it up up there. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I analyze things more than normal audience members. But I, you know, it's so rare that I get to go to a show these days. I used to always go see music um, when I moved to New York. and. You know, things change over the years. I, I, I'm so excited when I get to go see music now. <laughs> and back to you as a performer, I mean, here we are at Ronnie's where you are extremely close to the audience. I mean, almost, mm -hmm. almost touching distance. Yeah. Does that change the nature of it when, it's, when, when people are that close? And... I mean, I, I honestly think it's kind of nicer when people are close, because when they're far away, you feel a little distant from them. But I look out in, in the audience a little less when they're close, because it's a little scary. <laughs> but that's OK. It's the whites of the eyes and everything. Yeah, it's okay. I don't want to like stare at them too much if they're that close. Yeah. Well, what's, as you lead into a show, I mean, do you, is it good to be nervous? You need to be nervous, really, don't you, to some extent? To, to... Mm, I don't think you need to be nervous. I think you should not be like, whatever, let's get this over with. But like, you know, you should be excited, sure. Mm. I think nerves are okay, but if you're not nervous, it doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. You know, it just means you've done it a lot. <laughs> Hey Chris, can you play the flip side bass line for a second? Is there anything from Daybreaks in particular that you're, you know, that you look forward to when you sit on the set list? I mean, is there one or one or two that that really stand out for you as as live uh, moments? I mean, a lot of them do. It just depends on the night. I think flip side's always really fun to play live and. Carry on always feels comfortable and sweet and yeah, it just depends. It's really easy to go on stage and get kind of self-conscious and think, oh, they don't like this, oh, they don't like me, oh, you know, um, let the energy of the room sort of dictate how you're feeling about the show. But it's also important to not let that really mess with your head. Most times you're doing a show, these people are on your side, that's why they're there. And so if they're quiet and feeling very polite and not very like, woohoo, you have to remember it's, it's the room, it's the, maybe it's the venue, it's, maybe it's you, maybe you're not super like, hey, but um, it doesn't mean that they don't like you. And if they don't like you, fine, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to make some allowance for our famous English sense of reserve, oh, of course. Gosh. That's everywhere, you know, it just depends on the room. It depends on what they think they're supposed to do. I've ha had so many questions with interviews over the years about how, how, do, how do these audiences compare to these audiences, you know, country to country, and the, the truth is, it really depends on if it's seated, if they're serving drinks, if they're a little drunk, if they're, you know, if the venue is really harsh about don't take pictures or a lot of rules, you know, then it makes an audience more polite. So it depends. Jamie, you need anything else from us? Uh, no, we gotta open doors. Okay. Thanks. Well, I mean, if you need something. I'm so excited. 
after this, a little bit of a break for you, and, and, then, and then what? Do you, know, do you know what's next yet? I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah. good, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But good <laughs> place to be. Yeah, hopefully soon, yeah. yeah. Well, have a great show, Nora. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.